Hero. Okay. They didn't explain a lot of moves. Even to the military after World War II, they did. It was a monkey see, monkey do. The military people after World War II did not speak Japanese. None of them. And the people over there did not speak English, not one word. They learned some English in the dojo with their students. <clears throat> and once they learned to say block, that became the mother load. Everything was block, 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 block. What's this for? Block. What's that for? Block. What's that for? Block. What's this for? Two blocks. What's this for? Pseudo blocks. What's this for? Augmented block. What's this for? Down block. What's this for? Up block. How many people would ever use that as an up block? In a real fight situation, would you use that as an up block? But yet you do it, don't you? Do you call it a block? Be honest. Some of them, they have different, some of them are called blocks, some of them are called blocks. What are they called? I don't, they don't even give it a name. Well, now I'm giving you the name. He goes to push me. No, no, for camera. Yes, sir. He goes to push me. I usually like the biggest, strongest guy I can find for this one. Got that? Because most people I can put down with this technique. But if I get the biggest, strongest guy I can find, and you've got to remember that the Marines after the war were big and strong, and the Okinawans and the Japanese were little people. And if they went to put him down, they might run into difficulty. Give me good strength. They might run into difficulty. But if I do this, see what I did? Now, if you do the pinon cutters, the fifth pinon goes like this. It actually pulls back quick. That's to break his wrist. No, thank you. No, I know. <laughs> That's to break the wrist. In other words, I catch his hand. Now I'll do it full speed. And if I pull back to here, I got a broken wrist. I let go. In other words, I can just grab your hand and be here as, as quick as not and pull back to here. I have one kata that goes like this and steps and goes like that and I was told when I learned the kata, I'm blocking you, now I'm blocking you. And I said to my instructor, what happened to him? He's behind me. <laughs> oh, a bunch of those katas. Block, 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 block. He says, excuse me, when do I get to hit him? And he said, well, you'll get to kick a guy right now. You'll get to unload the kick. Jumps. People do jumps. A jump is never in front of your opponent. Do you understand that? Do your jump. Stop. You would think you were jumping in and backfisting me. Right? Wrong. Are you Taekwondo? I used to be, yes. Okay, sir. good. Taekwondo kicks, don't they? Yes, sir. Can you kick me? Um, no. <laughs> no. You understand? I always ask, I love people Taekwondo because they go like that. I go, if you're Taekwondo, why would you tie your legs up? You tie your legs up in a knot. You can't kick in your Taekwondo. Plus, the whole time you did the jump, I just had to step to here and you had no, your momentum was this way. Jumps are never done in front of you. You can knock me off balance. Now don't you move. The jump is always done behind your opponent. And the cross leg keeps you from falling on it. Because if you lose your balance or he grabs you, you can throw this out as an anchor. That's why it goes out that way. Does that make sense? The jump is never here. It's here. And he tried to push you. What if I grab this and now I jump there? Exactly. He doesn't want to see me jump there. And it would be exactly like the kata. I can have all of his fingers and jump there. I can have one of his fingers and jump there. The jump is needed when your opponent is a lot larger and stronger than you. I can get him to go down 
But if I had a big, strong monster, and I go like this, and I even step behind him like that, the monster's on the way to the floor, and I would jump behind him. I would literally take this, and don't you move, and I would go like that. And I'd be in the same position he was in, and he would be down there with a broken finger, broken hand, broken whatever, on the way to the floor. If he had a fist in my face, I would grab and push there. And if he was strong, I'm telling him, because I showed you how to put somebody down with that technique. Well, now the advanced part of the advanced part of it is to get this and jump back there. And this keeps me from falling on him. And this does allow me to kick or tread on his head. I cannot kick him standing. But when I'm in this position, if he goes to move, I can kick him in the head. And if I have him here and kick him with my foot, which is negative, and just tap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's okay, sir. That's what I come for. <laughs> just sit up for me. Sit there. Anytime the leg goes behind, <clears throat> your own foot is to keep you from falling off balance. And if you feel you're falling off balance, you just throw that back out like an anchor off a boat and it just pulls you to correct your balance. That's what that move is for. I'm going to let Chad Doolin, who is a policeman and one of our pressure point people, he's going to come out and teach you technique for 10 or 15 minutes. Everybody give Chad Doolin a round of applause. Okay, what I want to do is stay with some of the techniques we've looked at, stay with some of the same pressure points, put them together in a little bit different way. And I want to try and do a technique that I think everybody here will be able to do when they leave. Um, this is one of my favorites. You want to help me out with this? Sure. You'll, you'll have some of the, the bits and pieces of it to take back with you. Same move from our basic H pattern kata. We come from here, take this long crazy step around so that I can face my opponent instead of simply turning the face in. Or maybe there's a better reason for that. The moves, especially in your basic kata, take into account basic attacks from the front, but also basic attacks from the side and from the rear. What I want to look at, my partner's going to do a back bear hug, but he's going to be over my arms so that my hands are trapped. And he's being fairly nice right now, but the basic motion that you're going to have is about this much. If he locks down, he, you notice he's pinning me at about the elbows. A lot of people will tell you to go for his groin. Well, if he really locks down like he means it, guess what? I can't get my hands back to his groin. If he's bigger than me, he's going to lock me down harder and faster. Okay? He's about my same size. This gives me a little bit of, of breathing room here. He's the same pressure point. He's going to relax a little bit so I can show you what you're going to attack on him. Same pressure point that we looked at underneath the arm on the small bone side. Okay. Hook into this the same way we would hook into the wrist point. If he's really a monster and my arms are really compressed, I would use the point at the wrist. If I've got a little more leeway, I use the point here. Can you go ahead and lock it back down? What I want to do is be able to bend his wrist. I'm going to bring my feet together. See how I turn and get a release here? Now, how about that long step through? Start to turn. I want to go right into his leg. Spleen six, or down lower into the kidney point we looked at. Just a little tap. It's a buckle point. Notice how I trap his arm to my body. Let's take that from the other side also, so we can get both angles. Look at where his hand is as he falls. <coughs> into him here for the release. I turn. So I'm, this is monitoring his other hand so that he can't come loose and hit me. Seems like I should be vulnerable going through here, but shoot right into here to tap him and buckle him out. Here's the tension. Where does the, the so-called down block come in? We have a pressure point in the base of the tricep. 
that's a hit point. Okay? Angle and direction is through the tricep as though an arrow is going in. Releases the shoulder, releases the elbow. Notice, I just brushed his leg. I didn't kick it out. You saw him go down a little bit harder the first time. Look where his wrist is, pinned against my body. Okay, when I tap this, I let him go. If I don't, he'll go to the floor faster because of the pressure here, and he'll go to the floor with a broken wrist. Okay. Let's get through that one more time real slowly. This is something that can add meaning to your form, and it's something that's within the reach of all of you. Notice he grabbed me a little bit differently. This time I'm, I'm coming into the point that you did work on, right below his wrist. It doesn't matter because the angle and direction is the same. Okay. This is going up this way. This, is, this hand is coming down this way. Okay. Two-way action is something that Professor Wally J in a small circle jiu-jitsu talks about extensively. If I can, I can get the pinky here to turn him out. Okay. He's, yeah, go ahead and put it back. He, he's a little gun shot. His foot's back there now. That's okay. That just means I can slide through a little bit easier. If I have to, I can tap him in the right point there. Still gives me the same setup. Same strike into the arm. Okay. Something else that I, I would just like to share with you as far as the setup goes, this is more law enforcement related. <coughs> and, uh, let's, let's use Bob here so we don't have to take your shirt off and put it right back up. We have a couple of pressure points in the shoulder area here. And one of the least defensive tactic strikes that I learned is what you can hit somebody with the forearm in this manner, and you can. But if you hit somebody cold, it doesn't work very well. And this is something that Master Dillman articulates very, very well in his Basai tape. The strike down into this area works very well if you've got somebody a little bit dizzy. The reason I like this technique, and this is important, many of you here are black belts, many of you teach. That means many of you will be teaching police at some point in time. If you want to make a police officer a customer at your dojo for a long time, take a technique that his or her department teaches him, allows him to use, and make it work for him. Because he'll remember that. Any volunteers to feel this? Anyone? Sure, come on up. So let me use you one more time just because I want to show the non-setup version first. Yeah, I, he's, he's a little bit tweaked, but I haven't done anything that will really dizzy him. And he, he's being non-compliant, I want to get a cuffing hold on him, I'm going to come up and I'm going to tap him in the shoulder. Okay. He moves a little bit, his arms are very much free, he can do whatever he wants, thank you sir. <coughs> this, all I'm going to do for a set I'm going to come around this way. The flicking attack. No, you wouldn't do this on the street. You would set the person up how you would set them up. Maybe in the wrist points, maybe something else. What I'm going to do is just give him a little flick in here. Actually, Get that in there. And then just the same tap. Several uh, defensive tactics agencies endorse that string. Bronco stuff. You can call it that. You can put it that way in your report. It's good that way. But that's the setup is this. Your setup in the street is probably not going to be just that. Go with what your agency teaches. But for those of you who are going to be teaching police officers, that, that's something to remember. Be able to ask the officers you teach, what strikes are you allowed to use? What does your department allow you to use? And be able to put the pressure points into it for them. You might just save somebody's life that way. Thank you. Now I'm going to introduce uh, somebody I told you I've know, known in the excess of 20 years, and she was a top woman's competitor in both fighting and form. Like that's how we first met her at tournaments, our students against theirs, and and uh, we didn't really uh, talk as much back then because everybody wanted everybody's students to beat each other's. But it's not like that anymore. We're really good friends, and I'm going to introduce you to Judy Anderson, and she'll take over. Hi, we're going to do, 
switch gears just a little bit and talk about Filipino modern arnis, which was brought to this country by Grandmaster Remy Presas. And the wonderful thing about arnis is it translates so well to any style that you, that you work, because we're working empty hand, stick, if any of you have seen any of the, the videotapes that uh, Grandmaster Presas put out, he also works um, swords, machetes, spark swords. Um, I'll never forget that one time we filmed an instructional video, he goes, Ju, Ju, you come here. And we both have spark swords, and my eyes probably got as big as my face, so I'm like, doing what? And we, you actually learn to spar with sticks. And it's a, it's a non-contact form, because what Grandmaster Presas did was he made our niece very, 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 very safe to learn. Um, originally, stick fighting was done where every time, what you're going to see with Chad and I just a second, we're going to be hitting <laughs> stick to stick. Every time the stick is hitting the stick, it, it translates to actually hitting the body. So you wouldn't have very many students if that's what you did all the time in your school. So the, that was a really big innovation that he did. In the Philippines, of course, there are thousands of islands, and each of those islands had their own styles. What Grandmaster Presas did, his absolute genius, was he took the styles and incorporated them into his system, which is today called modern arnis. Now, one of, the fun, one of the fundamental principles in modern arnis is the brush hold strike. It can be used with uh, things like Mr. Dillman's teaching us today on how to get inside, how to maneuver. The brush can be setting up, and then the strike comes in with any of the strikes that he's shown us. And we can do that with stick to stick, empty hand to stick, or empty hand to empty hand. So, Chad, if you could come out for a second, please. Sure. We'll start off first with empty hand to empty hand. And if you watch, as Chad just comes at me, my idea is to brush, hold, and strike. That's all I want to do. That strike could be here, that strike could be here, that strike could be here, that strike could be here to here, wherever I want to take that strike. And that's working on the inside. I could do just the same thing on the outside, come brush, hold, strike, strike, go into a, a grapple, go into a joint lock. Any, I have many, many options once I get my hands on him. And this allows me to get inside and to really work that. If he comes at me with a stick, I drop mine, I don't have mine, it doesn't really matter. He comes at me, I brush hold, and I strike. And then I can take away, and then I've got the stick. All right, then he comes at me with a stick, and I've got a stick, yay! Brush hold and strike. I can come over top, brush hold, strike. I come on the outside, brush hold, strike. I come over top, brush hold, and strike. So I have many, many different options from working, whether I'm working empty hand or stick or stick to stick. And you say, okay, what's, what's the value of this training though? You can pick up anything. Once you start working with a stick, you can pick up anything. You could have an umbrella in your hand and you have instant training for that weapon. You could have a book in your hand. It's the same thing. Anything, this, this translates to any, any weapon. The other thing that it's really, really wonderful for is for any of you that are in sports, racket sports, whether it be tennis, racquetball, lacrosse, hockey, it's awesome because the eye-hand coordination that's involved, plus the strengthening that incorporates into the forearm, into the upper arm, is just absolutely terrific. So watch us do a little bit of brush hold strike first, just empty hand to empty hand, and watch how we do a give and take. It's really fun. It's a great exercise. We can brush hold strike. And I'm going to stay on the inside, he's going to stay on the outside for a second. And look at the body motion. We just work. And then I might come to the outside. He's on the inside now. And so he goes. Okay. And then we come stick to stick. And this is fun. Okay, he comes in, brush hold, strike. That's my turn. It's a give and take. And this builds really nice with a part. And he comes number two strike. And strike. I come number two strike. Control and strike. We can incorporate grappling with the stick because what the stick can do is give us leverage, leverage like you wouldn't believe. He comes with the number, what we call number one strike. I brush, hold, strike. Bam. He's right there. He doesn't have a choice. If I don't have a stick, it's the same thing. Brush, hold, strike. And here we are. Right to here. If he comes in with the number two strike. I can brush hold and strike. I switch hands, comes in, brush hold, strike. And I can use my stick then on the different points. And again, that just in increases the amount of leverage, increases the rub on the points, 
and it's just, it's a great art. So if you ever have an opportunity to take a seminar with Grandmaster Prasas, let me highly, highly recommend it. He travels ac across the country. He's frequently in seminars with Mr. Dillman, and they're, they're, they're just a dynamic duo. So I thank you very much. Uh, Judy is going to do several tapes for DojoTV.com, and she's going to do them on disarms, taking weapons <coughs> away, also on aerobics, kickboxing type thing. You know, the current craze, jump around, kick, punch. That was a joke, because I says, I says, right in the middle of my seminar, I'm going to introduce you, and she'll come out, everybody hopping around. I'll be the one going, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, we're going to introduce a friend of mine that, uh, I used to live in Washington, D.C. That's where I first met him. And I moved up to Pennsylvania in 1968. And I ran martial arts tournaments for 32 years. Twice a year, Sterling used to come to those tournaments and bring students. But he started out in my child's divisions and then got up into adult divisions. And then he became a full contact kickboxer. I told you that story. And he was very good at that. In fact, he's very, very good at everything he does. I'm going to introduce from Washington, D.C., my best buddy, Sterling Johnson. Hey, everyone volunteer, somebody about my size. Um, okay. Yeah, here he comes. Yeah, let's use him again. Okay, um, this is a technique that uh, we're going to show the women, like, say, a big guy grabs you. Okay. Around. 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 Around.